With us right now, I'm very, very pleased to have Professor William Black, Associate Professor of Economics and Law at the University of Kansas at Missouri, the author of the book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. He blogs over at NewEconomicPerspectives.org. Professor Black, welcome. Welcome back to the program. Thank you. But it's the University of Missouri at Kansas City. Aha. Uh-huh. At the, okay, we have a typo here. <laughs> Thank you for fixing that. That makes perfect sense. Um, you wrote this absolutely brilliant piece, Credit Suisse's Guilty Plea. The Wall Street Journal uses the right adjective to modify the wrong noun. People have been noticing that, you know, recently there was one bank that actually pled guilty to criminal activity. Other banks have been paying big fines, but, but we haven't seen any perp walks. We haven't seen any banks being taken down. What's what's going on? The the, the banksters crashed the economy. Uh, or, uh, let's start at the beginning. Did the banksters crash our economy? Yeah. So th- we ha- have a crash because of the three most destructive epidemics of what we call the biz accounting control fraud in world history. And they are a massive uh, fraud in the appraisal realm where the banks coerced uh, the appraisers to inflate the appraised value of a house, something no honest banker would do, but uh, works really well as a fraud scheme. The second epidemic was liar's loans, and the industry's own anti-fraud experts said that the incidence of fraud in these loans was 90%. Nine zero. Wow. After these warnings... Now, wait a second. Was this fraud by the, by the individual homeowners or fraud by the banks? Uh, the answer is some of the both, but overwhelmingly by the banks, according to investigators with the state attorney generals that okay. uh, actually looked at these matters. And, of course, the banks could have stopped the fraud by the individuals at any time by simply verifying the borrower's income so, you know, it was always the bank involved uh, in uh, these frauds. Well, and they were running ads. For, I mean, I, I was on the air at that time. They, they were running ads. Got no credit. Got no job. We can get you home. You know, uh, kind of absolutely. And again, after these warnings by their own anti-fraud experts, they increased the um, number of liars loans by 500 percent between 2003 and 2006. By 2006, 40% of all the home loans originated that year were liar's loans. Over half of all the loans called subprime were also liar's loans. They're not mutually exclusive. And at a 90% fraud incidence, that means that by 2006, just in that single year, the banks were pumping out $2 million fraudulently originated loans each year. So those are the two big fraud epidemics in loan origination, but of course there's no fraud exorcist. So when you're going to go to sell these loans, you can't make a representation and warranty that says, hi, Fannie Mae, I'm selling you a bunch of fraudulent loans. So you also have to make fraudulent reps and warranties. Uh, And uh, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission Uh, looked at the leading entity. Now, this is the entity hired by the buyers, remember? And this entity reported to their buyers that 46% of the time, the reps and warranties were fraudulent by the sellers of mortgages. So uh, I I ask all your listeners, viewers, (laughs) as such, uh, how often would you continue to use Amazon if 46% of the time they cheated you? Or how many? How often would you continue to take a check from somebody if forty-seven percent of the time it was it bounced, it was no good? Yeah, right. So yeah. Th- this is the financial version of "Don't ask, don't tell." So it is an incredible myth of a virgin crisis conceived without sin in the C-suites. The first such crisis in world history. Right now, I remember back in the late '90s when Ken Lay was riding high and taking down Gray Davis in California. And uh, he desperately wanted to get into the banking business because he had over 800 shell companies, and the banks were starting to hassle him about the, you know, the fact that he was stuffing his saving his uh, profits in one area and his losses in another, and playing games with the IRS. He wanted to own his own bank, and he wanted to be able to trade in energy commodities. 
in ways that didn't require a regulated marketplace to do it. And uh, Wendy Graham had left the, com the Commodities uh, Trading Board uh, to be a member of, ex of uh, Enron's board of directors. And her husband, Phil Graham, by coincidence, of course, in 99 and 2000, introduced two pieces of legislation. The Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act, which uh, blew up Glass-Steagall, allowed commercial banks and gambling banks to merge and loosened the rules on who could own a bank so Enron could get in the banking business if they wanted. And the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, which said that you didn't have to actually be a counterparty to the trades and, and you know, just basically loosened the whole thing and, and created this giant derivatives market, this multi-hundred trillion dollar derivatives market. Was that the... Was that the originating point of this massive fraud? Was that, you know, those two pieces of legislation by Phil Graham, is that where it started, or was, was there some other point, or, or was there a confluence of events? So what, what brought this about? It is a confluence, and yes, that was a substantial contributor. No, it wasn't the beginning. For one thing, in the story, uh, you left out the, uh, the fact that when Wendy Graham was chair of the Commodities Future Trading Commission, she changed the rules to further create a regulatory black hole for derivatives uh, in the That's energy right. trading context. That's right. So the, and then and she went to Enron, to, and then she went then on she Enron's went board. To Enron's board. Right. Uh, in the only fairness, I would add is that Phil Graham was hardly alone in the Commodities Future Modernization uh, Act. Uh, Rubin and Summers uh, and. Uh, you know, President Clinton were very strong. Oh, Bill Clinton happily signed these things. Uh, of of all of these things, as you say. Yeah. So, uh, what was the key uh, fact? Uh, it was in 1993. Uh, so, right at the beginning of the Clinton administration, and it's indeed I'm writing a book about it called Wrong Turn. Uh, this is precisely when we've had this enormous success gotten the thousand felony convictions in the savings and loan debacle. Uh, and the Clinton administration comes in, it reallocates the FBI agents and the U.S. attorneys so that they're no longer working uh, the bank fraud cases, moves them to uh, health fraud. Uh, but the really big thing is they uh, adopted reinventing government. And Bob Stone, who they put in charge of day-to-day -day running, of reinventing government has written a book and it's fabulous on the point you're asking because he explains how it was that Al Gore put him in charge of this. The two had never met before this meeting and at this meeting according to Bob Stone's book Bob Stone told Gore he only gave him one bit of substantive advice and the one bit of substantive advice was don't waste one second going after fraud. Really, we were, I, and I personally witnessed the next part. We were instructed as federal financial regulators that we were to refer to banks as our customers and to think of them as our customers. We were urged to create partnerships wherever possible with our customers. Uh, we were told to stop imposing, that was the word they used, regulations on our customers and to replace them with deliberately unenforceable guidelines uh, and we were told that enforcement actions and criminal cases were an indication of our failings as opposed to the industry's failings. Remarkable. You were a regulator at that time. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I want to hear more about that. We're talking with Professor Bill Black, uh, William Black, excuse me. Uh, associate Professor of Economics and Law at the University of Missouri and can University of Missouri at Kansas City. Uh, author of The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. He blogs over at NewEconomicPerspectives.org. We'll be right back. This is the Tom Hartman Program. NewEconomicPerspectives.org. The book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. Welcome back. So I, you know, Professor Black, I find this absolutely fascinating that this really originated with uh, Bill Clinton's 1993 when he first took over the White House, reinventing government. I remember that very well, uh, the slogans and everything. Um, there's a 
perhaps apocryphal story about Clinton in one of my books, actually, reprinted his New Covenant speech, which is a very FDR speech. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's certainly not the way he governed as president. And the perhaps apocryphal story is that about two weeks before he went into the White House, after, you know, before he was an, an sworn in, but at, long after the election, that uh, Larry Summers, Bob Rubin, and Alan Greenspan sat him down and said, son, we know you campaigned on being an FDR, you know, going to take on the banksters, the big guys, and all this kind of stuff. But here's the facts of life. Uh, do you think that that's what happened? No, uh, that story is not true. Okay. Um, and uh, I can tell you what actually happened. Uh, what actually happened uh, is that Clinton um, began the process of cutting the Office of Thrift Supervision staff by more than 50 percent, and he cut the FDIC staff, he had some help from Bush as well, by more than three quarters. When Clinton gave his first speech to financial re regulators on reinventing government, his opening line was, when I was campaigning for the nomination, in other words, well before this apocryphal thing you were telling about, I got more complaints about you people than anybody else in government. Wow. And he did then go on to, you know, uh, compliment them, saying you must have been doing something right uh, because you cleaned up this cesspool. No, uh, from the beginning, uh, he uh, was a big uh, foe of regulation. And, of course, people have to remember that while uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton did not, in fact, defraud the savings and loan in the Whitewater case, the guy who ran uh, the savings and loan uh, in the Whitewater case was just a classic leader of a control fraud. Uh, that The place was, in fact, a uh, front-to-back uh, fraud scheme. Huh. So there actually was something to Whitewater. Yes. Huh. He, and he was uh, convicted in a, a place where he w had tremendous local sympathy. Yeah. So uh, was Bill Clinton like just some kind of libertarian or quasi Republican? I mean, oh yeah, I mean he's the uh, he's a, he's, he's, he's worth a hundred million dollars now. I guess you know that kind of would get you there after being president. No, no, I mean he goes way back. He's the 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 leader actually of the New Democrats. Yeah, you're right. And uh, so it, it actually, uh, when you look over to England. Right, the uh, the prime minister right. New Labor. himself on Clinton. Yeah, yeah, uh, Blair. Yeah, Blair. Uh, 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 Tony Blair. Bush's two Bush's poodle. Yes, uh, um, exactly. Amazing. So, so meet the new Democrats, same as the old Republicans. Basically, <laughs> he became like Nixon. Well, no, they they specifically modeled themselves on the Republicans, except that their twist, which they thought was very clever was finance much bigger emphasis on finance than on main street so the traditional you know, republicans were main street but finance they were uh, often politically liberal on social issues right and so they were good uh, partners there. right and you can see where robert rubin would uh, influence that in a big way we'll be right back with more of professor william black right after this Republicans hate Bill Clinton for the wrong reasons. <laughs> it's, it's, it's that he was too Republican. He was too much like a Republican. Pro uh, professor Bill Black, uh, William Black is with us, uh, Associate Professor of Economics and Law at, tell me if I have this right, sir, the University of Missouri at Kansas City? Uh, bang on. Okay. Uh, author of The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One, blogging at the website neweconomicperspectives.org, along with uh, other great bloggers like Randy Ray and and Stephanie Keller and, and uh, others who have been Kel on this program. Keller, thank you, been on this program. Um, uh, so to bring this back to the present moment, we've got this fraud that was set up in a, in, in a large way in 1993 with Clinton's reinventing government, uh, was kicked into high gear at the very end of the Clinton administration with Phil Graham's uh, uh, legislation, and then the banks just took the ball and ran with it for seven years, and... 
committed massive criminal fraud internationally to the tune of trillions of dollars. Here we are today. What's going on? Right. So, but they ran for it with uh, for about fifteen years, uh -huh. um, and uh, the uh, appraisal one. Uh, people want to really look up again. This is in the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. You can read the fact that the appraisers actually put in writing their warning that they were being extorted to inflate appraisals in the year 2000, and this warning went to all the federal banking regulatory agencies. All right. So uh, that, that remember that's over a year before Enron collapses. We, this crisis was already a crisis. Wow. Wow. Now, the, the massive expansion, again, I would emphasize, between 2003 and 2006, this, um, the liar's loans expand 500%. And we also have great survey evidence on the appraisers. We have a survey in 2003 and a two, survey in 2006. In 2003, 55% of the appraisers say that they have personally been subjected to this extortion in the last calendar year. And when they run the survey again in 2006, the percentage is up to 90%. This is what we call in the biz a Gresham's dynamic. A Gresham's dynamic is when you gain a competitive advantage by cheating. And the result is that bad ethics drives good ethics out of the markets and the professions. Right. And then... I remember, it was just a weird coincidence, in 2007, I was reading a book that had been written back in the, in the late 30s, early 40s, on the history of the Great Depression. And they were talking about how the housing market started collapsing in 1927, late 1927, down in Florida, how it had inflated so much from 1920 to 27 that people were literally standing on street corners in Miami buying and selling each other, you know, uh, property speculatively, and the prices had gone up a thousand percent, all this kind of thing. And the, there was a hurricane or tornado or something came through there, and, and the, the housing market started collapsing in uh, 27, and in early 28, it was down 30 percent nationwide. The collapse had gone all the way up to New York and was heading out west. And, and I remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, if my memory is wrong on these dates, but I, but I, I remember doing this on the air. I think it was late 2007, it might have been too early 2008, I read a piece in the Financial Times that said, you know, the housing starts at down over 30% this quarter. And I went on the air and I said, I'm selling all my stock. This is exactly what happened in the late 20s. And I don't think this, this is going to be good for the stock market. Um, is my recollection of those events accurate? Yeah, it's actually even more parallel than you, what you've just said, because the uh, bubble stalled completely and, and never grew again uh, in 2006. Okay. Um, most people would say third quarter, some people would say second quarter 2006. And so by 2007, uh, prices were already declining in most parts of the United States. And in 2007, the mortgage banks, which have, because they have no deposit insurance, uh, find it harder to keep growing. Uh, in the Ponzi schemes, for the right. reasons I ex I've explained, uh, they started failing at the rate in early, uh, actually in late 2006, they started failing at the rate of one a week, and by mid-2007, it was up to two or three. Well, I remember uh, it was about a year, year and a half that I was on the air, and people were calling up, ridiculing me, saying, hey, I just made $1,000 on my so-and-so stock, and I'm like, I'm staying out of the market. You know, and and I just I just knew this thing was coming. You know, yeah, just, yeah. No one knows uh, when the bust is actually. You know, which month a right. bust is actually going to happen. But uh, you know that it's going to come. And uh, yes, there are lots of folks that got this right. Um, I, I'll tell you with the reaction though of a very conservative economist when I told him about this. Mm -hmm. He said, well, you know, so show me that you made millions of dollars. Like, I should have gone should have shorted the market in on this, yeah. and that would be the only way I could be credible if I was trying to profit at the expense of American homeowners. Yeah, which is pretty bizarre. Although, I'll, pretty I'll tell you, I, 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 I do own a couple thousand dollars worth of shares of VXX, which is a triple short. Just for the hell of it. I mean, it's just like just for fun. 
because um, I think it's going to happen all over again. Um, Professor Black, are, are, would you be available to spend the rest of the hour with us? Yes, certainly. Oh, that would be great. Uh, I just got a one-minute cue here, and we're, we're going we're gonna to have to wrap up this half hour in just a minute. We'll have a six-minute news break at the bottom of the hour, and then we can continue. We have a couple of callers who have questions for you. And sure. uh, just in a word, uh, very briefly, do you think that we're still in peril? Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, I don't think uh, that there will be a U.S.-inspired collapse until we get a much stronger economy and the, the newest bubble. Uh, but uh, I think there are huge problems in China, and I think that there are obvious potential problems given uh, everything that's happening in Europe right now. Yeah, and if uh, Ukraine was to become a hot situation, for example. Hotter. Uh, yeah, it's hotter. Yeah, darn yeah. hot. Yep. Professor William Black is with us, Associate Professor of Economics and Law at the University of Kansas, uh, University of Missouri at Kansas City. Author of The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. His website, neweconomicperspectives.org. We will be back with my questions and yours for Professor Black right after this. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Welcome back. Tom Harmon here with you, and we are talking with Professor William Black, Associate Professor of Economics and Law at the University of Missouri at Kansas City, author of The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. He blogs over at the neweconomicperspectives.org blog. And Professor Black, welcome back. Um, we, 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 we spent so much time in the first half hour just kind of going through the arc of history of how we got here that we never got to what I opened this thing with, which is this piece that you just wrote about how, you know, uh, Credit Suisse has now c admitted criminal activity, yet nobody's going to jail. And you're suggesting the entire country, actually, in some ways, or if I'm reading your piece right. Actually, I shouldn't try to characterize what you're saying. I should just ask you what you're saying. Um, wh what have we been doing in the seven, eight years since the banking crisis began in a really serious way. Uh, what have we been doing about it, and what, what should we have been doing about it? Well, people uh, know about um, at least the general details of the domestic bailout that the United States engineered. Uh, what people are less likely to know about is that we also bailed out internationally. Uh, and we did this in two particularly large ways involving Switzerland. One of uh, the two largest banks in Switzerland, Credit Suisse and UBS, were simply dead. Um, uh, deeply insolvent, um, no way to get cash, and in particular, no way to get dollars. And the uh, Swiss central bank couldn't come up with enough dollars, and they needed dollars for some of their liabilities. So the United States, uh, through the Federal Reserve, made in essence an unsecured loan of many billions of dollars to the Swiss Central Bank, which then used those dollars to help bail out uh, Credit Suisse and uh, UBS. Now, simultaneously... Uh, now, what UBS, year was this? Uh, so this is back in 2008. Okay. Pardon me. Um, and simultaneously, we were bringing an action against UBS, we, the Justice Department, uh, for criminal uh, tax fraud, uh, aiding and abetting U.S. Uh, tax cheats. These are, of course, very wealthy Americans who e didn't, weren't willing to pay even the Bush era uh, taxes with the dramatic reduction. Right, because this was all happening when George Bush was president. Uh, that is correct. And so um, we, uh, you know, helped bail out entities that were actively seeking to defraud our nation. Now, the second and related thing is uh, UBS was still in deep trouble, as were a number of other banks. So uh, Treasury Secretary Paulson and uh, with the support of uh, Geithner, who would become his successor, uh, secretly used AIG, which had failed and was under U.S. conservatorship, to bail out many large banks. Uh, now, this is primarily the infamous one is Goldman Sachs, 
And remember, Paulson had come uh, before being Treasurer's Secretary. He was head of Goldman Sachs. Uh, so he now used us to bail out his former firm. But it wasn't just a bunch of U.S. firms. In fact, something on the order of 40% of the money uh, went to foreign banks. And uh, UBS was one of them. And so UBS got $5 million. So we got a fine, which I rem don't remember whether it was seven fifty or eight twenty uh, million, but somewhere in that range against UBS. But we paid them five billion dollars. So in essence, we paid our own fine, plus gave them walking money uh, to the tune of over four billion dollars. Right. How so did, that was how did, that was the UBS story. Why why on earth would the Bush administration would anybody do that? Geithner, this is Geithner in his new book, right? Uh, stress test, right. where he, they claiming that they saved the world and it didn't cost us anything right. to save the world. Uh, so that you just had to pump out lots of money to the banks, and if you avoided the next banks from failing, uh, then eventually the economy would recover. But wait a minute, we we saved the world, but it didn't cost us anything to save the world. My recollection and and ongoing observation is that there are millions of of, of families who have been devastated, thrown out of work, lost their homes, uh, literally have become homeless, divorces, suicides, homicides, uh, child abuse. Uh, you know, I mean, literally millions, if not tens of millions of people have had their lives devastated by the actions of these guys. Geithner's saying it didn't cost us anything? That is correct. He says we actually made money on TARP. Would you agree with my characterization of, of the consequence of this bail, this bank fraud? Um, yes. It, it cost us over 10 million American jobs. Wow. It co the latest estimate of economists is that it will cost us 21 trillion dollars in lost production a Whoa. trillion is a thousand billion yeah 21 trillion and it's far worse in europe and the gdp of the entire united states is only around 15 trillion isn't it that is yes ballpark yeah, yeah. so uh these these guys stole the gdp of the united states for a year and a half and stuck it in their pocket and walked away with it and or or made well, it vanish not yeah, no, unfortunately, uh, if they had done that, it'd be easier to recover. Right. No, they created a net loss. It's like they, they had a, a big potlatch, if that's a familiar concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in which you destroy wealth at, right. at a, a scale never before seen in the history of the world. That's our bankers. And they're, they're still at it, right? Right. Now, I don't want to suggest that they simply destroyed wealth. You are correct that they made themselves massively wealthy uh, through these frauds as well. But the, the amount they gain compared to the amount they destroy is more on the range of, uh, you know, one to ten. Amazing. Amazing. So, uh, you know, I mean, when, uh, and again, correct me if I'm wrong in my, in my recollection of timelines or any of my facts, uh, but my recollection is that Reagan essentially deregulated the SNLs in in uh, eighty three, in the first 82. year eighty two. Okay, and that that deregulation came home to roost in eighty six when the SNLs collapsed and all the fraud was exposed and the Keating Five and everything. And came roost in eighty three. Pardon? It was it was immediate effect by nineteen eighty three. There were three hundred fraudulent savings and loans gra growing at an average rate of fifty percent. When wow. you grow at an average rate of 50% with compounding, you double in size every nine months. If re-regulation had not begun the next year, which is when it began, by the way, in the savings and loan context, you would have been facing you know, $10, $15 trillion in losses and 10 million jobs from the savings and loan debacle. Yeah. As we went through earlier, the re-regulation, the deregulation, that spurred the current crisis began in 1993 and the first meaningful act, and it was only semi-meaningful, of re-regulation occurred in 2009, or at least it was, became effective in 2009. So that's a 16-year lag. Wow. And, but, but when Reagan, uh, I, I watched a, about an hour-long speech by Bill Seidman, who recently passed away, who Reagan put in charge of the uh, 
Resolution Trust Corporation, was it called? You know, that 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 basically yes. they nationalized these SNLs. They fired all of the executives in these uh, banks. They uh, the stockholders all took a, a bath. Got you know they were screwed. Um, they protected the share the uh, the depositors, and then over the course of the following twenty some odd years. Bill Seidman reprivatized gradually the SNLs in a way that actually showed a profit to the United States government. At least this is how he characterized it. And and they identified over a thousand people that they wanted to prosecute. They uh, it took over eight hundred of them to court, and uh, many of them, like Charles Keating, famously went to prison. Um, why, when this happened, when the exact same scenario, you know, of you know Reagan deregulating the banks going to fraud, the banks crash. You know, when the exact same scenario happens with much bigger banks under under the under the watch of Clinton and Bush, when you know when when guy, uh, when uh, Paulson comes out, you know, with his trembling hand saying, "I need Congress to give me trillions of dollars based on these three pieces of paper." I can't tell you all about it, but you know, it's uh, please now. Um, why didn't they do what Reagan did? Yes, so I actually did this on uh, Fox Business News, of all things, when no one, by the way, used the phrase nationalization back in that era. But that's what he For, did. I, well, but oh, it's just a receivership action, right? Uh-huh. And, then you, and he didn't sell it back over 20 years. First, he continued a practice that we had done for seven years. Uh-huh. Now, the RTC wasn't created until um, the... Uh, 1989, late 1989. Okay. Uh, and so that was after, you know, s- uh, five and a half years of uh, receiverships and conservatorships doing exactly what the RTC did. But you're quite right. We uh, always wiped out the shareholders and we wiped out the subordinated debt holders, which is precisely what you're supposed to do. And we made the criminal referrals and we got over a thousand felony convictions just in cases designated as major by the Justice Department. And unlike the current folks, we hyper-prioritize to go after the 100 worst fraud schemes, which involve 300 fraudulent savings and loans and over 600 individuals. And we got a 90% conviction rate against those with the best defense lawyers in the world. Wow, that's amazing. Hold, Hold that thought. We'll be back with more of William Black right after this. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. Professor William Black, uh, former bank regulator, associate professor of economics, NewEconomicPerspectives.org. The best way to rob a bank is to own one. And welcome back, uh, Professor Black. Uh, still with us? You were telling us about the incredible successes. Uh, what what role did you play in in all this? Were you a bank regulator at that time? I was. Uh, I was uh, at the staff level, uh, the leader uh, of the re-regulation of the savings and loan industry, and I was one of many people um, who worked uh, to bring these uh, the find the criminals. Uh, make the criminal referrals, uh, do the investigations, and help with the prosecutions. Uh, And indeed, you ask what's different. Well, that's what's different. Uh, We made over 30,000 criminal referrals in the savings and loan debacle, which is less than one one one-hundredth the size, given the new estimates of the $21 trillion loss that I talked about, uh, of the current crisis. in the same agency, the Office of Thrift Supervision, in this crisis, they made zero criminal referrals. Wow. Okay, so this is what you, people don't understand and is being deliberately, they're being deliberately misled by Holder, uh, Attorney General Holder, and, and even the president uh, on these things. That's that's absolutely astounding. So. There's, and they've never restored the criminal referral process. And if you so, here's the key: mm-hmm. a bank won't make a criminal referral against its own CEO. Duh. So unless the agency makes the referral, it there will be no referral. There are 
roughly 2,000 FBI agents who investigate these kinds of cases. We have slightly over 1,000 industries in the United States. So we have two FBI agents per industry on white and elite white collar crimes. That means, A, they can't possibly have expertise in the industries, and B, it means they can't possibly walk a beat because they'd never find anything. So they wait in their office till they get a criminal referral. They're, those referrals aren't going to come from the banks. They're only going to come from the regulators, and the regulators eliminated the function under President Bush. Wow. And Obama has not restored it. And you haven't heard a single word ever from a banking regulator or holder or when he was head of the criminal division, Lanny Brewer, calling on the recreation of the criminal referral process and calling for whistleblowers to come forward. Have you ever now, heard that? Uh, here's, here's what I don't understand. This seems to make no political or economic sense. People are really PO'd. They're really angry. They're really hurt. Number one, so there's a political case to be made for perp walks. And number two, it's not good for our economy, for the banks to be <laughs> keep on crashing our economy. Why don't they do this? Is this a case of regulatory capture? No. Um, this is, it was beyond regulatory capture. Is this like our. criminal collusion by, by the, the uh, administration? Well, first you have to go back uh, to, again, the uh, Clinton and then the uh, Bush administration, where you have... Alan Greenspan in charge, and Alan Greenspan famously tells, you were talking about the Commodities Future Modernization Act, right. he famously tells Brooks Lee Bourne, you and I are going to disagree about regulation because you think fraud is a reason to regulate. And it isn't because the markets just automatically take care of it. Right, yeah, the, the whole thing, his whole speech. I heard Bill, Bill Seidman quote that speech. Uh, we'll be right back. Hang on. talking to Professor uh, William Black, Associate Professor of Economics and Law at the University of Missouri at Kansas City, author of The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One, blogging at neweconomicperspectives.org. Professor Black, just to, just to recap, um, there were serious criminal prosecutions of the SNL guys during the Reagan administration and the subsequent uh, Bush administration, uh, first Bush administration. There were no even attempts at prosecution of banksters when these frauds became obvious to the world in the last two years of the second Bush administration. Um, can you just quickly recap the difference between those two? And then I would ask the question, why? Well, yeah. I mean, again, if you don't get criminal referrals, then you don't get cases. If you don't get cases, then you never look for cases. So here's what happened. The FBI was so bereft of expertise because the regulators weren't there to help. And remember, when we helped, we were adding 2,000 regulators, each of whom had dramatically greater expertise in the industry and in fraud schemes in the industry than any FBI agent. Now, you're saying during the Bush administration, the Bush administration basically laid off all the regulators. No. The Clinton and Bush administrations collectively, and especially Clinton, cut the FDIC by more than three quarters, cut the Office of Thrift Supervision by more than half. But it isn't simply that. There used to be a criminal referral coordinator in every major office. Right. And he or she had the function of making these criminal referrals to meet every month or three, every three months at most with their counterparts at the FBI to get feedback. How are you doing? Are you, you know, working this case actively? Is there anything we can help you with? And we want you push, 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 do these cases. Right. That and function. This, and this is how you got 30,000 criminal referrals in the SNL, SNL thing that led correct. to 1,000 convictions. Okay. That function was eliminated. When? Under the Bush administration. Under the Bush administration. Well, Why? they were make again... They're not making any criminal referrals. So why, if you're cut, gutting your staff by three quarters, why are you going to have experienced people doing nothing? 
when you desperately need them to do other things. Wow. This is, this is organized insanity. Um, it, it is, and indeed, it's what it's like once the Greenspans of the world define fraud out of existence, then it would be as, as if I went to my colleagues in zoology at University of Missouri, Kansas City, and said, please come with me, I want to hunt for unicorns. Right. The, every, everybody knows unicorns don't exist, right? So you'd look at the person like a crazy person if he said there was fraud. Right, because so, Greenspan famously told Brooksley Bourne, um, you think fraud's a bad thing, we don't think it's a bad thing, because fraud is what causes markets to self-correct. People are worried about their reputations, and if they get, sla they get their hands slapped, they'll start behaving right. This and is, this is Ayn Rand. Folks, this is libertarian theology. It was, it was, it's actually far worse than Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand, von Mises, and von Hayek all explicitly say that the government must act to prevent fraud. Right. This is the acolyte generation that is far worse than the originals, right? The right. saints. This is the libertarians. Well, yeah, <laughs> as it were. yeah. But this is the mindless stuff. But it isn't just Greenspan. So the leading text to this day in which young lawyers uh, uh, or law students are taught the law and economics of corporate law is by Judge Frank Easterbrook and Daniel Fischel. And it says explicitly a rule against fraud is not necessary or even particularly important in the securities context because markets just automatically exclude fraud. Now, the kicker in all of that, if you, if you think that isn't insane enough, is Fischel was the consultant for Charles Keating, <laughs> Centrust, and for Drexel Burnham Lambert, all three accounting control frauds. Right. He tried his theories in the real world. He ended up praising Lincoln Savings as the best savings and loan in America. That was Charles Keating's bank. That was Charles Keating's bank. Of the Keating Five, who almost took down John McCain with him. Right. He was as wrong as it is humanly possible to be wrong. And then he wrote that sentence that I just quoted. And without ever telling the reader, oh, by the way, we tried this theory. And um, so sorry. <laughs> yeah, everything <laughs> so fell apart. Just, so they, in, the, they, in the two minutes we have left, uh, William ba Black, what... What are the lessons to take out of this, and what and what's what are your predictions for the future, if you don't mind? We still haven't fixed the things that create the criminogenic environments that produce wide-scale fraud. So right. first, compensation. Right? It isn't simply that compensation is large, although that's important. It is still overwhelmingly short-term reported earnings, which are the easy ones to create through accounting fraud. So that's the first area. The second area the three D's, deregulation, desupervision, and de facto decriminalization. We've been talking about all of those. Right, we need course. to roll back all three of those. We have to roll back the three of those. And then you have to uh, be absolute death on anything that allows a Gresham's dynamic. You must intervene vigorously as regulators when you get a warning from the appraisers saying we're being extorted to inflate the appraisals because otherwise you will get not just significant fraud, but as I demonstrated to you, 90% fraud incidents. Wow. Do you think we're in a stock market bubble right now? Yeah, but I don't think a particularly huge stock market bubble as these things go, because again, the economy isn't sufficiently robust and there's no super thing, new alleged super new thing. You know, like right. the high tech stuff. Right. So I think it's going to get wor considerably worse. So, yeah. This is. I, I've 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 heard from people. You know, expect it to go up another 10, 20 percent, and then boom. But who knows when or how? That's um, right. Yeah. Professor William Black, associate professor of economics and law at the University of Missouri at Kansas City, his book, "The Best Way to Rob a Bank Is to Own One." You can find it at all the local, uh, all the all the usual sources. He blogs over at NewEconomicPerspectives.org. His Twitter is William K. Black. Uh, Professor Black, thank you. Thank you, and it's the updated...
edition of the book that discusses the current crisis. You're listening to Tom Hartman.